One week from today, I'm heading to the Combine. Coverage on NFL Network began three minutes ago. Uh, and joining me here from the NFL Media Group, my colleague and uh, frequent uh, Rich Eisen Show uh, guest host, Tom Pelissero, back here on the program. How are you doing, Tom? Doing great. How are you, Rich? I'm doing fine, sir. Let's get right into it. What's the current scoop with Aaron Rodgers? Do we know where he is? Lights on, lights out, decision, all that business? What do you got for me? I think at this point, the next thing that I'm going to confidently speak on is when Aaron Rodgers tells the Packers what the hell he wants to do. Honestly, everything up until then is very much on Aaron's own schedule. He's made clear that there are very few people who really know exactly what he's doing at any given moment. What I would say is that despite you know whatever reports are coming out on a daily basis and speculation, the first move here belongs to Aaron Rodgers. The Packers cannot trade him if he doesn't want to be traded. He would need to sign a revised contract to allow Green Bay to facilitate a trade. He also could simply say, I'm not going. If they try to trade him to someplace he doesn't want to go, I'll retire. I'm not showing up. So they would have to work through that together. If he wants to return to Green Bay, the Packers – And as long as he's fully bought in, the Packers want him back. They had good conversations after the season. He is still, you know, down the stretch last season. He played at a high level. He kept him in it. Obviously, Week 18 didn't go the way they wanted it to. But there would also need to be further conversations about making sure that everybody's on the same page about the direct direction that the roster and the organization is going. And all that is without him actually telling anybody – including people he knows with other teams, that he's definitely going to play in 2023. So he's going through his process. I do anticipate we're going to have answers sooner than later. Uh, Right now, as we sit, and certainly as of last night, uh, there are those answers did not yet exist. This is up to Aaron. He's you $60 million fully guaranteed. Whatever happens from here, the Packers and Rodgers are going to work through it together. Well, and, and I'm sure you know the name Bob McGinn, and you know you know what uh, that's going to lead to my next question. Bob McGinn, having covered the Packers since Don Mikowski was the quarterback and Lindy Infante was the coach, he kind of knows where what's going on in the Green Bay front office, despite having been retired on a day-to-day basis uh, for the last couple of years. He says the Packers are, quote-unquote, disgusted with Rodgers and are done with him. What do you, what do you make of that report? Tom. I certainly know Bob. I would say nobody has told me that they are disgusted with Aaron Rodgers. I think that it is natural when you give someone a unprecedented type of contract, basically ripping up the remaining contract and giving them what amounts to a three year, hundred fifty fifty million plus dollar deal like they did last year, you're anticipating you're gonna get somebody who's fully bought in and is going to play at a really high level. And it didn't work out that way. In 2022, he had the finger injury. That probably impacted him more than people realized at the time. He had some other injuries that he played through. Did, as I, as I said, played better down the stretch as things got going. But then you go right back into the Willie or Walty and you know keeping the, the franchise waiting. I think it's natural for people to be frustrated by that listen to win in the nfl your best players your highest paid players have to play at a really high level that was not the case on the whole for aaron Rodgers with the packers last year but again i would just go back to all i can speak for is what i know mm-hmm. which is that if Rodgers wants to play for the packers and if he is bought into the way that they are want to proceed here then the packers want him back and they would expect that he's going to come back and play really well in 2023. So he's then let's make up his mind first. So let's say he doesn't want to play for the Packers anymore um, and he wants to be traded. What does the market look like? We're all assuming Nathaniel Hackett is the new offensive coordinator for the Jets, uh, who just had a meeting with Derek Carr, and they'd be interested. And we're assuming Devontae Adams is in Vegas. But we're assuming, and thus we're assuming the Raiders would be interested in him, despite Josh McDaniels having his set way of doing things being his track record. What What's the market for, for Rodgers outside of Green Bay? Tom? I would anticipate you're going to have several teams involved at least. The challenging part of actually 
pegging what the trade price is and ultimately the market is you're getting a player who not only is due $60 million this year, but that you're now going to take over the year to year Aaron Rodgers watch. In other words, how much do you give up for a player who potentially is only going to be there for one season? You go back to a year ago and when the Broncos were evaluating their options they paid more in terms of draft picks for Russell Wilson than they would have expected to pay for Aaron Rodgers. Just because with Russell Wilson, and of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, and you can go back to the trade, the contract, and everything else and evaluate it, but they evaluated this as Russell Wilson's going to be the quarterback here for three, five, seven years. With Rodgers, it would be a, a one-off. So, you know, what exactly do the Packers get? I would guarantee you that they've done some research historically on – players who at that stage in their career were traded. They have a pretty good uh, track record themselves, specifically trading a quarterback at the end to the Jets uh, with Favre, who was not a big price in that trade. And he ultimately spent one year there, retired a second time, unretired a second time, went to Minnesota and beat the Packers twice in 2009. Different spot right now uh, with Aaron Rodgers, but some of the some of the similar dynamics here. And then the money is a factor. Not everybody's going to want to pay that type of money and pay out draft picks for a one-year rental. But there are spots, like you mentioned the Jets, you know, they seem to have everything else in place. They've got a really good young roster. They seem like they're set up well, but they don't have a quarterback. That may be a team that's that's willing to go all in on this. Teams like Tennessee, they run a variation of a similar offense. Could they potentially get involved? You mentioned the Raiders. I think that the natural connections with them are probably more so Guys like Jimmy Garoppolo, who have run that system, Josh McDaniels is going to want to, but you can't cross them off. I mean, half the league right now, Rich, doesn't have a firm quarterback plan. If you look around the league, how many teams right now can you confidently say we know who their starting quarterback is? All of which is to say, if Rodgers decides he wants to play and does not want to play in Green Bay or does not want to play under whatever circumstances are laid out for how the Packers are going to proceed here, then he's going to become available and the Packers are going to have a market for him. But also the other dynamic here is because he basically has veto power over any destination because of both the contract and the the retirement threat, he can narrow it down to more or less one team and say, I'm only going there. And then you lack the, you know, let's say the, you know, the type of leverage that the Texans have with Deshaun Watson, where you could pin a price, say everybody's got to meet it, and then let four teams all try to beat each other out for the guy. Tom Palacero here on the Rich Eisen Show. Our colleague at the NFL Media Group, David Carr, speaking on NFL Total Access Monday night about his brother Derek, saying that uh, he's going to go on a long free agency tour, and and, uh, he's already, as we all know, uh, the Saints were interested prior to his release. He had a, a meeting with the Jets that, by all accounts, went very well. Don't you think he would? He, it would be best suited for him to make his move before Rodgers and the rest of the free agency begins? He's got the dance floor all to himself. Wouldn't you think he would tell a team, you want me, you can get me now if you're going to wait for Rodgers or wait for anybody else, wait to see what the Ravens do with the franchise tag with, with, uh, with Lamar Jackson, that you, know, you could lose me? Don't you think he should use the moment for the, to strike while the iron's hot? What, what, what can you tell me on that front? Tom. Well, that's assuming that any of those teams involved have made an offer, much less an offer that's at the price that Derek Carr would want. If you're the Jets and you're waiting to see what happens with Aaron Rodgers, you're probably not rushing to give Derek Carr $30 million a year right now or whatever the number might be that he's got in his head that he should be getting on the marketplace. Absolutely. I mean, all these dominoes are interconnected, but the best offer for Derek Carr also might be out there after somebody misses out or after Rodgers goes back to Green Bay. There's, there's a lot of – it is a fascinating environment. It reminds me of last year where there were some things that happened. For instance, you know, think about this last year. You go back, Rich. The Falcons believed that they had a shot at Deshaun Watson, so they go as far in as they were willing to go there. They weren't going to do the fully guaranteed contract, but they made their swing at it, and then he chooses Cleveland. Well, in the meantime, Matt Ryan's looking at that and saying, you know what, I'm probably going to want to move on here. So then they deal him to Indianapolis – for a third round pick. Meanwhile, the Russell Wilson deal gets done to Denver. Washington is watching that happen and watching the Matt Ryan trade happen. They go, well, we can't miss out. They all of a sudden drastically increase their offer for Carson Wentz and acquire him. All those things were on parallel tracks and they all impacted one another. 
So now, let's say by the end of the week, Aaron Rodgers makes his decision, and whatever that decision is, everything else now is going to play off of that. If he decides to go back to Green Bay, or he says, hey, I only want to be traded to, let's say, Las Vegas, now all of a sudden the Jets might be willing to go stronger in for a Derek Carr. So Carr's doing you know, what he should, which is evaluating his options here. If somebody blows him away with an offer, I would expect that he would take that offer. Mm-hmm. If he had a chance to go to the Saints, they agreed to – the framework of a trade with the Raiders before that visit, but my understanding was the contract, which would have $40 million guaranteed, was an issue for New Orleans. And so he could still end up back there. He could end up with the Jets. That's how Frank Reich was talking today, saying they're not ready to say whether they'll bring him in for a look with the Panthers. But there's a lot of different options out there, and the best offer for Derek Carr might come after some of these other dominoes fall. So give me, Tom Pelissero, the name of a team that doesn't have, one would think, uh, a seat at the game of musical chairs or the quarterback carousel that appears set that might change minds. Give me the name of a team that, you know, do you think would sit on the quarterback carousel that we're not talking about right now? You got one? Uh, I would not overlook Baltimore. I don't know how much you've talked about that, but the reality is there is a scenario here where they trade Lamar Jackson for a significant number of draft picks. They've tried for over a year to get a deal done. I know everybody just says, pay Lamar. They're trying. They're just doing it under the traditional structure that's not a fully guaranteed contract like Deshaun Watson got with, from a football perspective, unprecedented leverage. Lamar is still two years away from getting to the, the open market because they could tag him twice at relatively reasonable numbers, less than what they've been offering him on a long-term deal. If this thing goes sideways, if they can't get something done, I fully anticipate they're going to tag Lamar Jackson. If they use the exclusive tag, they can shop him around and see what type of price they potentially can get. Or they could use the non-exclusive tag, let somebody else negotiate with them, and then depending what that offer is, they could match it, basically let somebody else do their dirty work for them and get the long-term contract done, or let him go for two first-rounders. I think that that's a, a real scenario that you have to evaluate as we move forward here. I think that until Seattle gets something done with Geno Smith, you can't rule out the possibility that they potentially are going to end up back in the quarterback market. Uh, you know, We mentioned some of the others. Washington has said they're committed to Sam Howell. Is the right situation out there that they could be in the market for a quarterback? I would certainly expect. I don't think that you roll and just say, you know, it's it's – Sam Howell or bust for the commanders. They're going to add another quarterback regardless. I don't know how much appetite the Colts have to go back into that veteran quarterback market once again, you know, but their quarterback situation is unsettled. Obviously we talked about the Raiders and the Jets. What do the 49ers do? Brock Purdy's got surgery tomorrow. We'll know more about his prognosis and his readiness for the start of the season. After that, Carolina's in that mix. Arizona's got to do something because we simply don't know when Kyler Murray is going to get back on the field. I don't anticipate that's going to be, making some big trade, but they may spend some money at the position just so they can compete in the short term. And then you got Tennessee that has Ryan Tannehill under contract. He's due, I think, $27 million, no guarantees. So they've got decisions that they're going to have to make. You know, Miami has said that they're confident in Tua Tungavailoa's health. They're going to need another quarterback, though, because Teddy Bridgewater was on a one-year deal. We can go on and on. I mean, there's so many of these teams. We haven't even mentioned the Giants. Who I was going to ask you that. What about the Giants? Giants? Is is it is it true? Forty five million dollar a year ask for Daniel Jones? What about is that? What is I, it really? I have there? not heard specifically the forty five million dollar number. I do anticipate that if a Daniel Jones deal gets done, it begins with a four. Wow. If you look at all the deals that have gotten done uh, with quarterbacks over the past couple of years here. They're all 40 plus million. You know, if you, Kirk Cousins got 40 million last year on a one year, $40 million extension, you've got Stafford was right at the $40 million mark. Obviously, Kyler was above that. Mahomes was above that. The Rogers deal, you know, is deflated with two dummy years on the back end, but really it's a $50 million per year deal. All these deals that are getting done are at that number. And you can say, well, Daniel Jones hasn't accomplished what those guys had or, you know, doesn't have. You know, the playoff wins and things like that, though he already picked up, you know, one in his young career here. But he's still, he's a young quarterback. His worst-case scenario right now would seem to be he gets tagged for $30-plus million this year. Then if a deal doesn't get done again, potentially gets tagged for 120% of that next year. 
he's got a lot of reasons if he's willing to bet on himself to say that I want, you know, I want to have a contract that's in line with those other quarterbacks. And this is a time rich that the salary cap is going to be a record number. What is it? 224.8. I think next season, the biggest jump non COVID related that in NFL history in terms of the cap, we could, by the end of some of these long-term deals that are getting done, we have a $300 million per club cap. You're talking about five, six, seven years out. I mean, the, the gambling revenue, the TV revenue, the Sunday ticket deal, that's all going to continue to cause the salary cap to rise here. And so, you know, the smart agents, I think, in a lot of cases are being patient with some of these guys, especially if you've got the leverage right now, which Daniel Jones does, which is, hey, if you don't get this done, well, then you're going to have to tag me. Now you're forced to either get something done with Saquon or run the risk of losing him. Again, it's there's one of the situations, Rich, where all these different things are kind of interconnected here. And really the Giants are the team this year that you have to look at when you got two pretty clear franchise tag candidates. There's going to be some urgency on the club end to get something done by March 7th. And then last one for you, Tom Pellicero, by the way, great job spinning us around that carousel there. Uh, last one for you uh, was the, late, the final hire of the uh, NFL coaching uh, season. Jonathan Gannon, the former defensive coordinator, now the new Arizona Cardinals head coach. A video the Cardinals put together of him greeting Cardinals players um, kind of went viral because there was a, sort of a, a, a Steve Buscemi, how do you do fellow kids type meme um, that went out there with it. And just seeing him, you know, go up to Kyler Murray and say, you know, people ask him, well, you know, why would you take a, a, this open job? Well, you know, do they have a franchise quarterback? Yes, they do. And then they hire, you know, a 35-year-old coach who I'd not heard of before, to be honest with you. And this had, doesn't have to do with his qualifications. All I could sit here and say, like, is Murray going to be – you got to sell him on the program. And, and I know the NBA and the NFL are different. Uh, but if Murray doesn't buy into Drew Petzing coming in from the, the, the Browns and, and he's rehabbing his knee, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I just didn't get the best possible vibe, to be honest with you. And I'm wondering if, the, if that's something that's shared by the NFL community. And you could tell me completely otherwise. What, what are you hearing on that front? Well, let's start with Jonathan Gannon. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of swagger to him. Yep. He is very, very confident. If you have seen the viral video of him rolling down the window of his uh, SUV and yelling to some Eagles fans, we're going to bleep and gut these guys while sitting in traffic outside the stadium before the 49ers game, that's Jonathan Gannon. No, I saw he that. He doesn't think anybody's going to stop him. Yep. He's very, he's very confident as he's coming in, uh, and he's also very confident in his guys. He worked with Drew Petsing for years in Minnesota. Pet seems a guy who came up a lot like Kevin Stefanski did in terms of yeah. he coached like four or five different positions, spent time with the quarterbacks, the receivers, learned every aspect of the offense, and has been the number one guy in the NFL for OC uh, for a, a number of years. Yeah, he's a 35-year-old, uh, first-time offensive coordinator, never called plays in an NFL game, but somebody who was you know highly regarded certainly on that Cleveland staff as well. And then, you know, on the defensive side, too, let's also mention they're going to have the youngest coordinator in the NFL, one of the youngest in history, and Nick Rallis, who's 29 years old. A funny story on that, uh, like, I went back in my email and found it 15 years ago, an email from my buddy going, who was coaching uh, youth football at the time in our hometown of Edina, Minnesota, saying there's this kid on my team who's just unbelievable. He's going to be even better than his brother, Nick Rallis. At this point, he's coaching, like, nine-year-olds. Rallis was a, you know, he came up and he was a star player in high school, started at the University of Minnesota. His brother is Madcap Moss, the WWE wrestler who also played at the University of Minnesota. Nick's a really sharp guy, so much so that the Eagles were trying to keep him, and at least one other team was also trying to hire him after he got that offer from the Cardinals. So it's a young staff. He'll balance it out with, you know, an older staff sure. with, you know, some other coaches that they're going to bring in. I don't want to be an ageist because, again, I, to, I, I, to be honest, yeah. just just jumping in here, I was a 26-year-old getting on SportsCenter, and a lot of people might have thought, who the hell is this young kid? And, uh, and I, 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 I don't mean to be an ageist. I, I'm wondering how this plays with Kyler Murray and his future there, to be very honest with you, Tom. Right. And so with, with Kyler, again, it's a unique situation because he's hurt. You know, he's, he's rehabbing from a knee injury. Maybe he's ready around mid-season. We'll see. You would not anticipate that they're going to take any chances with Kyler Murray. And I would fairly say 
that even though Jonathan Gannon said, you know, whatever the line was, make no mistake, we're going to win games here. I don't think realistically the Cardinals are approaching 2023 as a year where they're going to win big. You're going to have to, you know, slice some things in terms of salaries, move on from some older players, uh, certainly in terms of, uh, you know, Kyler not being ready. You're not going to be playing with, as, as Gannon would say, an elite quarterback. So this is very much going to be a, a rebuild type of year, and you're going to have time for some of these young coaches to grow into it. Now, how Kyler reacts to things behind the scenes, how he embraces the offense, how he embraces this coaching staff, how he approaches everything about his job is, of course, going to be worth monitoring for all the all the discussions that have gone into this over the last couple of years about uh, Kyler's approach. But, you know, Gannon's right on one thing. In terms of just pure talent, Kyler Murray is one of the most talented players and, and dynamic playmakers uh, within the league. If things don't work out, if he's not the same quarterback, his contract is certainly movable in the future. You're not going to do it right now because the guy is coming off of an injury, mm-hmm. but certainly you would have some pivot points down the line. But the, the number one relationship here is going to be, I think even more so than Drew Petsy, it's going to be Jonathan Gannon with Kyler Murray. Absolutely. Because one thing, listen, going all the way back to when he was at Oklahoma, when you talked to people on Kyler Murray, what you were told was he's not what you normally think of in terms of a quarterback leader. He didn't really hang out with teammates. He hung out with the baseball players there. He's more to himself. He's very intense. And everybody respected the hell out of him because he's such a talented player. So you're not going to suddenly turn him into, you know, I mean, name your quarterback. It's not going to be Phillip Rivers overnight. But you've got to get the best out of Kyler Murray and make sure that, you know, from a program perspective, he fits into what you want to do. And they're embracing that challenge right now. I don't think that Jonathan Gannon went in there and said, hey, I want to move up from Kyler Murray ASAP. But let's see all this, all, all how all this works out. And we probably won't see it on the field until – next november at best tom thanks for the time man look for more of my calls we'll chat again soon combine right around the corner franchise tags can be applied slapped however you want it today so news is going to start breaking fast thanks for the call you got it rich thanks. Tom, tom pelissero at tom pelissero on twitter follow him you should i do he's awesome a lot of food for thought right there catch the rich eisen show every single day on the roku channel 12 to 3 eastern for free 